Hello everyone, welcome to the Super Cloud 4, the fourth edition, our quarterly segment. We do this every quarter, we're going to unpack the hottest trends in enterprise tech. This fourth episode is about generative AI, it's the hottest thing. For the past year we've been talking about it going way back to November, and every quarter we're going to unpack it. We have a great lineup, we've got AWS, we've got Google, we've got Salesforce, Dell, AI Ethics with SaaS, SaaS CTO. AI21 Labs, all the hottest startups, enterprises, and, and guests here. Two days of packed coverage, leaders in the enterprise, and we're excited to kick it off. We're going to do an intro, we're going to do a little analysis, I'm going to get the program going. I'm here with Dave Vellante, my co-host, and Rob Streche with the Cube Research. Guys, this is our fourth installment every quarter. Uh, Dave, we started this out a year ago, and I uh, can't believe in a year we got three in this year, four for the 12 months. Um, it's fun, we bring a lot of content to the table, and it's just been amazing to bring the people together and the community to, and the, the caliber of talent uh, that are weighing in and contributing to the program has been phenomenal. So I just want to say thanks to you guys for all the work you guys do and research. Rob, and welcome to the team. Yeah, hey, first of all, the place looks great. I got, I got the tie, the tie memo to match the, <laughs> the background. And yeah, this is the fourth SuperCloud. You remember, like last year, we set up the concept of SuperCloud. We brought in the community. We brought in technical experts. Is this technically viable? We definitely confirmed it was, we tightened up the definition, and then since then, we've been knocking down security. Obviously, AI is front and center. We had uh, great sessions on data. There's just so much, con I'm still unpacking from the first <laughs> SuperCloud. Amazing. We have AWS keynoting. We got Rotten South, who's going to come on, VP. We got AI21 Labs uh, uh, on as well. We've also talked with Hugging Face in the past. We got founders and startups that are focused on AI. We got analysts segments. We got CEO sides with the enterprise leaders, Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, Palo Alto Networks, Dell's new AI leader, and just tons of content. Snowflake, Amplitude, Walmart, PwC, Google Public Sector, healthcare experts. The, every single industry is impacted. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the underlying thread is that this is changing how organizations are really looking at their data, entering into conversations with their customers using that data, and having their customers actually engage with them through the AI. It's really exciting stuff. Guys, I want to start the kickoff and just get into the program. I mentioned some of the names we have. We're going to hear from the leaders. The big themes that are jumping out from the, from the pre-interviews and what we're going to hear in the program is clearly this three ideas going on. The chatbot, we've seen that, done that, that's moved on to co-pilot like human augmentation and then predictive. All that's got data. And this is kind of foundational, kind of like low hanging fruit. And then the big question is role of open source and the power law, Dave, that we published around what the language models are, what the foundation model is big, better than small, what's in production, what's not in production, Rob, kind of what's the reality. We're going to hear a lot of that this week and this show, what's real, what's hype and where the hype matches it, Dave. What's, uh, what do you guys see out there in terms of, as we look at this program, what's jumping out as the core theme? I mean, obviously we're very excited, as is everybody, about, about AI and generative AI, but I think it's important to your point, is you got to separate the hype from, from reality. And when you look at reality, you look at IT spending, IT spending's not going up dramatically. It's funny, I saw a, 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 a note from Gartner saying IT spending in 2024 is going to grow by eight and a half percent. There is currently no evidence of that in any of the spending <laughs> data. You know, right now it's sort of very, pretty tepid. And so I think, you know, given the geopolitical uncertainties and when you talk to customers and you do the, the surveys, it's, it's much, much lower than, and now it could change and AI could be that big driver. But right now what's happening, John and Rob is, and I think you see this in the data, that AI initiatives are stealing from other budgets. The AI is by far now the number one sector that, that with, with, in terms of spending momentum, and it's stealing from other areas. Yeah. And most of the AI is still experimental. Now the good news is, and we've talked about this, John, is it, the, the AI experimentation and spending is actually matching the hype. But still, it hasn't translated yet into a productivity boost, which Eric Brynjolfsson, MIT professor and economist said, he would be disappointed if productivity didn't globally, didn't increase from its current 1.2% to as much as 4% or even more, if that happens, Look out, that's, that's huge news. Rob, what's your take on the role of data? You've been tracking this part of the CUBE research team. Um, what's, what's the data aspect, data angle here? Yeah, I, I think it's everybody is trying to figure out where is all their data. They're, so there's a big infrastructure push to, do I consolidate it all into one data platform? Do I have multiple data platforms? How do I have a mesh over them? Where do I do transformation? There's a lot still going on at that data layer as people talk about building data products. And I think what we're seeing is that really people are 
focused on those you know segmented language models or smaller language models and being focused like I'm using it for HR I'm using it for finance and bringing that data together because they own that and that's their IP but there's big security concerns and how do I have a moat between that and make sure that it's not going back into the models so there's a lot still going on with that data infrastructure. And I know we have some great guests on that we're going to talk pretty deep about that. Guys, I want to get your thoughts. We obviously, we have AWS uh, keynoting. We also got an enterprise panel headed up by one of our community members, Howie Shu, who's heads up AI and at machine learning at Palo Alto Networks. He's going to run a panel with Google, Salesforce, and Microsoft. Okay, that's the, I call it the enterprise leader, that perspective. Then we have a startup panel that I'm going to moderate with a bunch of, startup CEOs who are trying to get to that B round, Rob, A, B round financing um, in this market. And then, so we have that kind of developer and we have a founder panel, okay, going on. So it's going to be multiple perspectives there. But we also had uh, a conversation with Snowflake, um, Box CTO, Reggie Townsend, the AI ethics person at SAS, and the CTO, Brian Harris at SAS. So we got conservative approach. SAS is kind of a conservative company. They got a lot of installed base, so they're not rushing and saying, buy the new shiny new toy with AI, but clearly you're leaning in. They've had data and machine learning, but not generative AI. Now they're bringing that to the table. So the, the spectrum of consumption and usage and experimentation is across the board. There's no one playbook. It's not like, oh, you got to be a pioneer or an innovator every single company from conservative to cutting edge is leaning into AI. What does that yeah. tell us? Yeah, I mean, I think to Dave's point, I think the spending kind of tells us that people are experimenting still. And I, I think, again, we're, you know, you had the first ones who got out there with ChatGPT like bringing that in and using that to get some efficiencies and things of that nature. But the long tail from a power law perspective is really where we're starting to see people start to make those plans. And I think that's where the real investment happens. I, I mean, again, it's, I think- Hey, what does it tell you? Can, can we cue the power law and yeah, actually talk absolutely. about that a little yeah. bit? So this is something that, that Rob and John and I developed and, and on the vertical axis. So we, we took the concept of a power law, we kind of took some liberties with it and applied it to Gen AI. The vertical axis is the size of the model, the horizontal, is the model specificity. That's where all the industry action is happening. That orange line is basically an example of the music industry where there were like four companies, four labels that dominated the music industry of the past. And that's why you see that hard right angle. What we're saying here, and John Furrier, you, you've talked a lot about yep. this, those red arrows, that's open source and third party pulling the torso up. So we think it's going to be a smoother line. And then, so you got the big guys, the big cloud guys and NVIDIA and OpenAI with those large language models, the size of model is huge. But then as you go down to the right, a huge long tail, both on premises with specialized AI and then at the edge, the telco edge, we have, we have a guest who's going to be talking about that, a system on a chip. And that's really where all the action is. The last thing I want to say, John, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this because yeah. you helped develop this model. In fact, you, you were the seed, the, the catalyst of this. This is not spending. This is most of the spending, I personally think, is going to be on that long tail. There's going to be a lot of money made you know, by the big cloud giants, but there'll be a lot of action on that yeah. long tail. Yeah, well, and also, you mentioned the music, put that slide back up again, we'll show that again. The, the tail, the, there was no, there's no neck and no torso, no stomach, basically it's a straight line down and straight tail. This, not only was the music industry, but if you remember when the web started, search looked like this, the top queries were you know, well known, and then what happened is as the population of websites came out, you saw that expand in that torso, you saw kind of affiliate marketing kick, and then you still had the long tail of keywords, so search, was an interesting power law as well. Now it's ironic, Rob, that and Dave, is that search is one of the key uh, problems that AI solves. Copilot, retrieval, was getting into some of that data. It's a data graph. And if you look at the models again, I'll put yeah, that, bring that back, back up back again. Up yeah. again. The, 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 the dynamic also includes open source. So the third party open source also plays in the tail as well. So what's happening now, and we're going to hear this, and this is going to be the premise we're going to unpack over the course of the next six months after this super cloud is, as these models develop, you're seeing a, a flipping of the script. Some of the more proprietary data sets, Rob, I use the word proprietary, will live in the long tail. Right. They'll be smaller, high quality data. And so we're seeing a trend where today they call the, the chat open AI proprietary models. They're actually more open because they crawl the web. The proprietary models will be the proprietary data sets, which is the intellectual property. That's going to be the value of the company. And then what's going to happen is people are going to leverage the training of the bigger models to reduce their costs and focus on inference. So a lot of model integration is going to come down and this kind of comes down to the cloud native uh, world. And you're going to see a lot of 
changes in this in this long tail, the tail will get most maintained, the torso and belly will grow, and the model will define who you are as a company because that's where your IP will be and that's will be the engine of the application. So that's going to be one of our things we're going to look at. And, and I think that's notable cutting edge dynamic and we're seeing it play out with open source. There are two other really important points there. The, the, the big blockers to implementing uh, uh, Gen AI in production are privacy, data privacy, security, compliance and governance. And so that's where these specialized models are going to have to shine. And the second point I want to make, and we're going to hear this from SEMA AI, that telco edge, that's going to be all about power per watt, you know, low cost, high performance, very, very efficient. And those are going to be ARM-based processors. And the, I've, I've thought for a while now that the economics at the edge Right now, you know, they're maybe not ready for mainstream enterprise, even though we see it with Amazon and Graviton and others, but yeah. that economic disruption that's going to come from the edge could be massive because it could yeah. create a whole new price performance game in the enterprise. Yeah, I, I think that's really the key. Where the work actually gets done is going to be closer to the consumer, yeah. not all in a centralized cloud database. You're going to have it where you train your model centrally, you distribute out for in, you know, inference, and it gets done, the work gets done out there, especially yeah. when you talk about IOT and machine, actual machine data being, you don't want to pull it all the way back into your cloud to be able to do all of it. You want actions to take place within seconds out in there or yeah. milliseconds. And one of the things we talked about on our Cube Pod, John, is yeah. what's going to happen on prem, like that middle piece <laughs> of that, 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 that power law. You know, will the on prem guys have that model? Yeah. Uh, optionality that's in the cloud today, you, you were definitely on the side of, hey, a lot of stuff is going to happen on Yeah, prem. I mean, I think the models models point to the fact that the data is back in the game again. It's The data is where the action is. And, and it's interesting, the word proprietary, I use that on purpose because yeah. that's a bad word. The other bad word that we used to poo-poo you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, was walled gardens. If you look at the models, the ones that are successful, the ones, Rob, are proprietary intellectual property of the company or the entrepreneur, and they put a wall around it. And then they interface with other models via API. So you're going to start to see these data sets look like walled gardens because the high quality actually makes them better. The bigger the model, the more dirty yep. data or bad data you have, the more hallucinations kick in. So I think we're going to see kind of a neural network AI system emerge. And this is what's going to be interesting to see how that app development kicks in. So it's the classic cloud game, infrastructure, middleware, and apps, Dave, and the middleware is the data and the apps are going to be either AI wrappers, like we're seeing today, or uh, other cloud, or cloud native, AI native. So we're going to start to hear AI native more. I don't really know what that means, but we get buzzword. You know. But, but and, and, and as well, to your point, when you talk to customers about where they're spending their time, they're spending a lot of time on getting their data quality right. Because we don't have the data quality right. And Vast uh, uh, is coming in today, and they talk about this concept of model collapse, right? They, uh, Chris Meller had a pretty good article on that, where when the large language models are actually creating more data, this derivative data, you know, it starts to get stupid. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, there's three, there's, three, there's three areas I want to talk about you guys about and get your reaction because we've been seeing it in some of the interviews. There's three areas of AI development right now. One is I call the AI wrapper, and that's where people take their data, they call open AI or a big language model, and wrap that around their data and produce a UI. And we, we do that with some of our cube data. I think Bloomberg's doing it with their GPT. That's, that's a, like a website to me. That's like an instant app. And I used to be kind of down on that, but I actually see that as a very viable game plan. And then there's going to be the cloud native, AI native, proprietary app. And then there's going to be some sort of infrastructure piece developed. That's where the action is right now. And right now everyone loves the AI wrappers because it's very easy to execute if you got the data. Right. And I think that's one category. And the other one that's, that's a wild card right now is how do you actually build from the ground up modern application with AI native built yeah. in. But I think you hit on a really good point in the Bloomberg as an example, because IBM, for instance, for Watson X, has gone out and trained one of the granite versions of Watson X for finance on the Bloomberg data. So you start to look at where that data comes from and how it's actually utilized, and can it be used on-prem or in a smaller model in that very specific or segmented language model that can be used. And 
that, that's bringing an opportunity for companies to monetize their data in a different way. And I think we're going to start to see that as well as part of the economy is how do I get better data, cleaner data that I know is known good for doing, you know, I want to produce a, you know, LLM for my CFO so that my 10Ks, my 10Qs get developed in the same way and they're formatted. That's a really good use case for it. So you start to look at the use cases that get pulled along with this and the cleansing of the data, the importance of that, where it is and how it gets refreshed. Okay, I don't want to push my 10Q data, my financial data into a model, but I want to use a model on it. So how do I do that? And how do I do that walled garden in a yeah. you know, effective way? And, and Rob, you talked, you mentioned some of the horses on the track. It's probably worth naming some names. AWS with SageMaker, they were one of the leading companies. You had Microsoft because of their deal with Databricks. Mm -hmm. They were pretty prominent. And Google always had good AI. They just didn't have the cloud momentum or the size of the cloud. Mm -hmm. What happened was the open AI deal with Microsoft, first of all, open AI shot up to the mindshare lead. Everybody's using you know, their products, whether it's ChatGPT or other tools that they have. Microsoft does that deal with them. They shoot up. Amazon, still prominent, but moved a little bit, you know, not as prominent just in terms of the, the mind share and the market share. Mm -hmm. Google ticked up a little bit. And then you had Anthropic, you know, because they're everywhere, coming out of nowhere. Databricks still pretty prominent. And you have IBM, you mentioned IBM. They went from kind of nowhere on the momentum and now they're bop, popping back up and even Oracle, of course, is showing up. So they're, they're the incumbents that are playing. And then you have a smattering of other companies yeah. that, that are in there, like data robots of the world. Yeah. Um, and so it's a pretty crowded space yeah, right now, yeah. but the big cloud guys are, are fairly dominant. Well, the cloud guys aren't going to go away and that's the dynamic, but you bring up a good point. And I think this is a nuanced point, but I'll bring it up because you, you mentioned those names. All those companies are all saying the same thing. We've been doing AI for a long time. Okay, that's like, the classic line, and they're right, but they weren't doing generative AI. Right. I think what's why we're focusing on the super cloud as generative AI is that that creates a new dynamic, because when you generate something, that's new data, and the question of whether it's good data or synthetic data, as you generate data, concepts like vector databases and retrieval kick in, so things like memory come up. I've had a conversation uh, multiple times in the past month, Dave, where the word memory came up. Not like memory as in like hardware. Like remembering. Like remembering <laughs> that in the retrieval vector embeds that this answer was good because that could go away. So now there's a whole observability question, Rob. Which models, which tweak knob that I push changes the output. If you look at a lot of these, these AI models, you type in the same question, you get different answers. Yeah, right? and it, so that's not memoring anything. So memory is a huge topic. Yeah, and you can talk about data lineage and catalogs and how that all ties together. I think when you get to it, there is this, hey, we're still learning how to build these platforms to really be effective long term. I mean, everybody complained when ChatGPT 3.5 started to you know, give worse answers because they were segmenting the model down and how that was being retrieved. But you start to look at how do you get at yeah. the right answers more consistently, especially if you're building it yourself. And I think that's where people are really focused is, how do I build the infrastructure out? Where do I build it out? Where is it most cost effective? And I think one thing that we probably won't have time to get to is the sustainability of it, yeah. because that is a huge issue when you look at, I think it's six uh, chat GPT requests uses 16 ounces of water in Microsoft's data center in Iowa. It's like, it's a bottle of water for, you know, doing one prompt, you know, you're going in to figure something out in ChatGPT. That's huge. Yeah. And, and that's some where that long tail edge it is. And, and efficient oh. processors is going to. Well, I mean, not to, not to bring up like the distributed computing, but blockchain, Dave, we, we've been talking about this data sets being distributed in these walled garden little data sets. You know, I think at the end of the day, the future, when you look to the future, the, what will be written about our era, my prediction is, is that we're going to look back and saying, what we knew about data warehouses and data is completely going to change. I think we're going to see a complete changeover, radical transformation of how data is managed. Through distributed data. How da yeah. Well, just data in general. I mean, Rob and I riff on this all the time on theCUBE. It's like, you know, you know, Snowflake and Databricks, they could be extinct if this goes in a distributed way or they get bigger and better, but certainly the old data silo is going to go away because unless it's integrated into the AI. So again, the old way of handling data management is going to be upside down but, but I think because it's of compliance, because of governance. It, it is going to go distributed, and those companies are going to have to pivot and, and, and adopt and, and adapt 
to that distributed nature. Well, I mean, Databricks I mean, and uh, an event they announced the, uh, open source, and they got Parquet and Iceberg now with just as, m as minor edits. Like everybody's that whole, can, all those worlds are coming together, right? I mean, they yeah, have and sharing it, and everything else. I, I think, but that lowers the bar to get into the to scale side of the yeah. data. How do you scale the data? It's a disruptive force. Yeah, There's no, no question about it, and those companies have to respond. And it's going to be distributed. I mean, there's no doubt. They're all they all know it, and I think it's a what segment of this do I do? I think what we're seeing is that a lot of features that have been data platforms are coming together. And you can't just be one piece of the data platform anymore. You have to have multiple pieces to be viable going forward. Yeah, the buzzword is bring AI to the data. Well, the data is going to be everywhere. Yes. So you're going to be bringing AI everywhere. And that's where your comments about inference yeah. are, are critical. Well, costs are driving it. You look at the silicon action. It's in data, infrastructure, data. Apps. Yeah, your stack. And I would just encourage people to go check out the latest breaking analysis. We did some, the ETR guys and their survey work. Uh, you know, a lot of the, you'll, you'll see the momentum of the various companies and it's, and it's worth sort of putting it in context. Well, we got a great program. We are here. This is part of our Super Cloud 4. This is our part of our in-studio live performance. We're live on theCUBE here and we have guests coming into the studio. Folks who couldn't make it, we're going to bring them in remotely to have a conversation here with theCUBE. But we got some great lineups here. We got a uh, founder panel coming up. Um, we got a uh, executive panel with an analyst. We got uh, Gen AI startups, Gen AI enterprise leaders, and of course we got the big the big companies, AWS. We got uh, AI Twenty One Labs, hot startup, and in, in, in one of the large language models, and uh, just some great companies with their leaders. Uh, we got Intel coming on as well. Hopefully, address all these concerns around processing and compute. And we're going to hear some interesting ideas around how to get these workloads into production. What's the bottleneck? with the big trends. This is where we unpack Generate AI. Thanks for watching and stay with us more for the next keynote presentation from AWS.